Welcome to the Entertainment Engine. Welcome to Season 2 of the Entertainment Engine Podcast. I'm Pete Moore. And I'm Bex Gregory. This podcast was created by our company, Seamless Entertainment. We're providing in-depth advice and information for creatives pursuing a career in the entertainment industry. It's a great passion of ours and we're looking forward to sharing our knowledge with you all. Each week, we'll be bringing our listeners some great entertainment facts and news, mixed in with special guest interviews from seasoned professionals who share their insight and experience of the business. You can listen and subscribe to the podcast on all streaming platforms so you never miss an episode. And what a bonus, it's totally free. And now it's time to introduce our next special guest on the show this week, Ross King. The Scottish television presenter, actor and writer, best known for being the LA correspondent for ITV breakfast programmes, Lorraine and Good Morning Britain. In 2018 New Year Honours, Ross was appointed MBE for services in broadcasting, the arts and charity. Ross has interviewed some of the biggest stars in show business, including Tom Cruise, Gerard Butler, Julia Roberts, George Clooney and every James Bond, just to name a few. Here's part one of the conversation we had recently with Ross King. Well, welcome to the Entertainment Engine and today we have a really special guest, Mr Ross King, the international correspondent all the way from Los Angeles. Ross, how are you? I'm I'm so good. I, I'm feeling cheated though. Now that I've realised it's Pete and Bex and not Posh and Bex, <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been I've been undersold here. <laughs> if the Trade Descriptions Act was still around, I'm going to sue you guys. <laughs> but then again, yeah, I, I've I've been described as an entertainer, so we're all going to get sued. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I suppose just to really kick off, Ross, how has your weekend been? And I suppose the bigger question, how have you you, you and your family coped the pandemic? Mm. Yeah, you know what? I, I mean, I do feel, I mean, I often sort of joke and always say too blessed to be stressed. But, you know, it really does apply out here. You know, you've got the weather, which is sensational. So... And I'm lucky where I live, right up in the in the in the Hollywood Hills. There's plenty of places that you can walk, and so you know I do feel really, really lucky. Mm. Uh, you know, I speak to my my family in Scotland and friends, obviously all over the UK. And you know, the restrictions that you guys have been under are so much more than than we are. And also, I've been able to travel a bit, mainly for work. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you know, I've been lucky to have gone to quite a few different places and to film in different places. So it doesn't feel as as bad and you know i you know i hear so many people struggling so badly so i always feel that even at times if it's been you know you go oh i can't do this or i i couldn't do that or oh my goodness me i have to wear a mask again or whatever mm-hmm. it's it's nothing compared to what other people have gone through so so yeah you know i look at it i feel very very fortunate to uh, have come this far and not have been affected that much no that's that's, that's really good. good to hear and i think um sort of touching on um, I suppose your upbringing as well, Ross, because I believe you was you was born in Scotland, in Glasgow, in Scotland. Yeah, yeah, and from Glasgow to a very uh, you know warm warm city. You're there five minutes. Someone will set fire to your jacket, <laughs> or yeah. uh, all the old yeah. all the old gags. I mean, I, I used to always say when people came over from America. My my uh, my story always was that when you get up in the morning and you open the curtains, the room will actually get darker. <laughs> so, <laughs> <clears throat> well, my um, um, it's really funny because my mum was born in Bells Hill, so I have- at Bells Hill, I know Bells Hill. <laughs> yeah, so um, I got a great affinity there. And um, but I, I, I was born in London, but mm. I, I think um, you know always my my Scottish heritage, which I'm you probably feel the same. I should think. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Can you can you do a good Scottish accent? No, I thing? can't actually. <laughs> but my mum, oh, uh-huh. she, she was unbelievable. When her accent would be so strong, Ross, when she got angry with me, and that, I couldn't understand mm. that. <laughs> and you go, go and get me something to hit you yeah. with. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Peter, Peter, I, come here. <laughs> so, oh, well, it's not bad at all. Peter, <laughs> Peter, it's not a bad attempt. <laughs> what, what, what relatives? What family do you still have in Scotland, Ross? 
I still have uh, some cousins there, and then I've got my sister and her husband, and uh, their two kids who are grown up now. But uh, yeah, so I, you know, and I go back. I mean, that that's probably been one of the hardest things for me with the whole lockdown situation is that I haven't been home in obviously over. Well, it will be coming up to a year and a mm. half fairly soon, mm. and I was so used to being back. You know, I'd be back on average four, five times a year. Oh, right. So that that seems really wow. strange for me. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, I just gone back to that whole silly thing of when your mum or your dad would go, go and get me something to hit you yeah. with. It was a really, you know, come back with a feather or something. Yeah. It was just like a really silly thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, I'll go and get you something really hard. Well, no. No. <laughs> well, my mum used to say to me, she, she, she would say with different relatives and because I was born in London, but she would always say, no, no, Peter's 90% Scottish and 10% English, and that's the way it's going to be. And if anyone wants to oh. have an argument, they come and argue with me, and that was really it, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, so, Ross, yeah, tell us a little bit more, obviously, about your, you know, your career, really. I mean, Ross, your stage debut was at five years old with your first radio yeah. broadcast at 15, and television debut yeah. at 17. So tell us a little bit more yeah. about these young experiences that you've had. Yeah, no, I was very lucky to get involved in everything. I mean, I was, you know, mum and dad were very musical. Um, and so I think that was part of my my background and my upbringing. So I was surrounded by music all the time, which was which was really lovely. So, you know, and I was mm-hmm. that, that annoying little kid that would be pushed out at weddings and parties and, you know, and go, go and <laughs> sing or tell a joke or do impressions or things like that. And, um, <laughs> yeah. and then when I was, yeah, when I was five, I think I was about five, my mum, we did a little film thing for uh, Scottish television at the time. Um, and so I would, I mean, I was so young, I don't really remember it, but I just remember, you know, the cameras and all the rest of it and thinking, oh, this is great fun. Um, and then getting into plays, obviously, when I was a kid at school. And then, um, yeah, luckily getting into hospital radio and then local radio when I was 15 and 16, which was just such a huge thing for me. Um, and I'd been at school, obviously, I'd been at school, thankfully, sometimes. <laughs> and um, <laughs> on a good day. <laughs> on a good day, I would go. Yeah. Let's dive in. <laughs> Not when it was double maths on a Thursday. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Oh, I'm with no. you. I got a dog one. off from school for that one. Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, sir. I, no, I'm admitting yeah. to it. I played true on a Thursday afternoon. Oh. Um, yeah, so um, I, at school, I, you know, I, I I really enjoyed school, but I loved it because I played so many sports and I was going to be a, a, a footballer. And, oh, that was the plan until. Unfortunately, they find out that I actually wasn't very good. So <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was that kind of, you know, that was the end of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, it, it was interesting going through school because that was, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to be the captain of the school teams and things like that. So it was it was kind of like, OK, that's probably going to happen. Um, and then um, then I just realized, weirdly enough, that I thought I, I, I want to go into the world of show business and. And my dad, bless him, I I remember him vividly saying to me, look, son, you know, we're not discouraging you, but we don't know Coco the Clown, so we can't get you into the circus. We don't know what to do. (laughs) And um, weirdly enough, I started doing some of the school discos and then Roddy Hood, who was my maths teacher, who's now discovering that that's why I wasn't there on a Thursday afternoon. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. 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 (laughs) um, He was brilliant. He came to me and said, look, I hear that hospital radio is a good way to get into broadcasting. And Mrs. Lawson, whose son, Alan, works at the BBC now and also does stuff at hospital radio, um, he thinks that, um, you know, they they could take you in and show you around and all that stuff. And I went in. And the weirdest thing was that I'd never ever thought about being a DJ or anything like that. And they took me in and put me in the studio. And then they said, like, you know, this is how it works. And, um, you know, these are the faders. These are the controls. And they were just showing me, you know, because at some point you may get to present because obviously you have to do the whole hospital visiting stuff. And for people who don't know hospital radio, there's one in Glasgow called HBS Glasgow. And they've got their own little radio station that broadcasts to all the the radio, all the hospitals in, in Glasgow and, and the west of Scotland. It's, you know, it's quite a mm. great 
you know, network. Anyway, um, long story short is that they, they would put on the records and then they would say, like, the introduction, this is back in the days when it was very much, you know, Capital 95.8 FM, blah, blah, yeah, blah, yeah, you know, yeah. all that yeah. stuff. <laughs> and, you know, more yeah. power from the Houston Tower and all that stuff. And <laughs> it was... Um, you'd have to talk over the introduction of the record so you would hit the the vocals. And they said, like, this has got an 18-second intro. And I would listen to it and i go, well, actually, it's a it's a four-bar intro. And they went, what? And I said, yeah, because I, I come from musical background, so I know, you know, the, the musical bars. And then I know, I know introductions because I've sung with so many different bands <laughs> that I know mm-hmm. when to come in. So they, they had this kid and they would go, watch this. And so I didn't use the stopwatch or anything. And I just talked over the beginning of every single record. And it, they were bringing people in going, watch this kid. He never crashes a voiceover, as it was said at the time. So uh, so it was weird. And then I was so lucky I got a, a radio show on Hospital Radio soon after that. I think, yeah, I was about 15, maybe just turning 16. And it was Ross King's Disco Delights. And I, I even had my own jingle, which went something like, Ross King, bubbling over with fun. <laughs> nice. Very sad. Oh, wow. Very sad. <laughs> oh. And I think just sort of staying with radio, Ross, you also became the youngest daytime host on Scotland's Radio Clyde. I did. Winning many awards in the process, including a prestigious Sony Award. I did. Was this yeah. a surprise, you know, when you won the award? And oh, did absolutely. it inspire you to continue? Listen, I'm surprised any time I get any kind of award. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, to come out to America and get news Emmys and things like that are just ridiculous. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was... It, it was great. Again, you know, I just think I was really lucky that the time that I came through in radio and, you know, all the other DJs were getting a bit older and in came this young 16-year-old long blonde hair and all that stuff. And I didn't give Pat Sharp a run for his money, but I did have longish hair. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, that was it. And I just was great. I, I, I don't mean I was great. I mean, it was great that I was so lucky that I got on so quickly and I got to do the road shows and all the stuff that, you know, maybe some of the older DJs were getting a bit fed up doing and things like that. So it was it was amazing. It was a wonderful experience. And then there was a great broadcaster there called Jack McLaughlin, um, who was such a great mentor, gave me such great advice uh, on radio and television. He'd done a lot of both. And, you know, he said to me at the time, you know, you want to be a broadcaster, don't just, you know, because you wanted to obviously be the hit DJ. He was doing the, you know, the top 30 countdown and all that stuff. And he said, no, be a broadcaster. So I would do the art show. I would do the the movie show. You know, I would do as many different kind of shows as I could. And then I was lucky from that, that uh, it, the TV, uh, BBC Scotland, they were looking for someone to do a show over the holidays that took over the kids slot in the morning. And we did it live every day. And they just thought, well, somebody who does live radio could be good for this. And uh, that was it. So I got into that really early. So, yeah. I mean, (laughs) you will hear me use the word lucky a lot. It's because I am. (laughs) (laughs) No, but you must have been also as well, Ross. You you obviously had great support from your parents as well, your family Mm. to help you. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. I had the best mom, best mom and dad in the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so lucky. And they taught me so many great things. You know, mum would always say, do your best. That's mm. that's all you can do. And I think I was about 23 when I realised what she meant. Because, you know, I think you always think, of course I'll do my best, but it's all the things that go into doing your best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, whether it be at football. Yeah. You know, I'd leave the house, you go, okay, son, do your best. That's all you can do. I need to think, well, of course I'm going to do that. But then you think, okay, you know, am I training enough? Am I eating the right yeah. stuff? Am I, yeah. you know, fit enough? Yeah. And it's like, you know, do your best. If it's TV or if it's, if I'm doing a play or a musical, have I warmed up? Have I been doing, have I been having enough singing lessons? Am I, mm-hmm. you know, have I learned my lines enough? Have I learned them back to front? You know, all the stuff that you can do to really do your best because, as mum rightly said, that's all you can do. If you do your best, you can't do any more than that. And it's great because it served me really well, especially coming to America, you know, where it's very hard breaking through, is that if you went for an audition, if you left the audition and thought, well, I did my best, well, then 
that's it. You can't do any better than that. And if it's not what they wanted, or even maybe if it wasn't good enough for them, you've done all that you can do. And I think that was a great thing for me to to really learn that and take that on board and just think, yep, yeah, did my best. There we are. Yeah, it's a, it's a great support, isn't it? To just know mm, that your yeah, family are backing yeah. you, and um, yeah. you know, and you. But you've got that raw talent. You know, you must have had at a really young age, and it just grew and in, into what you're obviously doing now, which is fantastic. Well, again, I've just been really lucky to. I think to to have been able to do so many different things, um, and I think Johnny Carson. Uh, who's a brilliant talk show host out here, did The Tonight Show for so many years. Yeah. Always said that it's a bit like if <laughs> whatever jokes you hear, you'll remember them and at some point you'll get to use them at some point. But equally, any skills that you have, at some point they'll be called upon. So I feel really lucky to have, you know, done radio and TV and theatre and straight plays and musicals and some little movies and... Um, you know, performed on cruise ships. I, I, you know, I've been able to do a heck of a lot, mm-hmm. um, but it's been such a great grounding and a great experience as well. And you just never know when, you know, it's going, it's going to be needed because, you know, even in my work for Lorraine or for Good Morning Britain, you know, you could be covering a terrorist attack, as I have done, and then next minute you're sort of singing on stage in Las Vegas with Donny Osmond or something. It's you know, it's just all the different things that you never know that you're going to be called upon to do. So again, just feel really lucky that to, mm-hmm. to have the background. Yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. having and having yeah. that, it's really interesting. You mentioned Johnny Carson as well, Ross, because one of our last guests. Um, is uh, U.S. Attorney uh, David Halfen and um, oh wow! I thought you were going to see Johnny Carson. No, 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 no. And and, and David, (laughs) it was through a medium, was it? (laughs) (laughs) Well, Dave, we've known David quite a long time, and he's sort of works at all the major studios. And one of the conversations we I had with David was, who was your first client? And it was Johnny Carson. Wow! Um, Yeah, and and David was on. If you ever get to, I have to hook you up, Ross, because David is a phenomenal attorney, and he's a really nice Mm -hmm. guy. And um, he said, well, one day I was on I was on the Paramount lot, Pete, and, you know, I just sort of wandered into the office and Johnny Carson was there and I just started having a conversation. And that's how we sort of, David explained to me about his first <laughs> client was Johnny Carson. I was like, oh, my God. Phenomenal. Yeah, really yeah. good. So it's interesting when you mention that, really. <laughs> oh, it's amazing, isn't it? It's isn't a it? small world. It is. It, is. Small, it is. It's a small world, but I wouldn't like to paint it. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. No. no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. So, Ross, with your TV career, obviously starting out, you know, quite young, what would you say with all the shows that you've done over the years, would you say that you've been most proud of because you've done some really eclectic things, you know, over the years? Wow. Um, now, let me think. Um, I don't I don't really know. You know, the interesting thing for me is that I've, I've never been one of those people that was always, I mean, I'm always moving always, with an act like mine, you have to. I've always <laughs> moved, kept moving. Um, and I tend not to really look back. I always look forward. But yep. I also have been lucky to be one of these people that I never think, oh, I wish I was doing something else. Because I, I see so many people do that. And, you know, and it's easy to do it. You know, you're doing a you're doing a play and you think, oh, I wish I was back doing a TV show. And then mm. you're doing a TV show and then you think, I wish I was on stage. And then you're doing that and then you think, I wish I was doing a film and all that stuff. Um, I've just always been really happy doing what I'm doing at the time because, again, because I've had such an amazing life in terms of opportunities that I could do so many different things. Mm -hmm. So I've never been one of those, you know, the, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side, but the grass still needs cutting and (laughs) all those expressions, (laughs) which are so true. So I've never, ever been like that. So I've enjoyed so everything that I've done, you know, going back to, again, when I was doing kids TV, you know, I think, you know, when I I was doing the radio, I'm really proud of the fact that when I was at the radio station, because I was so young that I could, uh, influence people a bit and bring out new bands at the time, like Wet, 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 Hue and Cry and Deacon yeah, Blue, yeah, yeah. And, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, a, a, an era that I was involved in. Yeah. Then in TV, uh, to again, to try and help with bands like Take That, which is why, you know, Gary Barlow and I have been pals for such a long, long time. Um, so that, that was nice. Um, you know, doing Pebble Mill, a show that I did 
long time ago yeah. was was great. I had, you know, to travel the world and interview all the people that I did and, you know, to, ha to have your own chat show, basically what it was uh, on BBC was just amazing. And, you know, doing kids shows like the 815 from Manchester, yeah. which yeah, at yeah. the time was just great yeah. fun yeah. too. And again, where, you know, Take That came through. Um, yeah, so, and I, I, you know, again, the opportunities and then coming out to America and working at, at KTLA, one of the big stations here in Los Angeles. Again, stuff that I never, ever really dreamed of. You know, it's it's funny sometimes, as I said, I don't really look back. Mm. But occasionally, if you're doing something like we're doing today and people mention things and you kind of forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. And it's quite nice, actually, when a little light is shone on it and you think, oh, yeah. And, you know, my, my sister the other day was, was talking about a thing and I was doing a gig at the London Palladium and she was saying, remember when you got mum and dad in the royal box? And I was thinking... <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and then I did. And then I did remember it. And I remember coming out for the opening of the yeah. show and then, you know, bowing in front of the Royal Box and then saying, you know, actually, she's not in, but but another queen is. And it's my mum. It's your mum, you know, yeah. yeah. My mum. So, you wow. know, you just think of all the, you know, all those things. And, yeah, yeah. I, again, it, it all becomes, it becomes a bit of a blur, but it's yeah. also a lovely thing. But, again... I'm always moving forward. It's always I'm thinking, what's the next thing? What can I do now? What or what can I do that will challenge me a bit more again? Or what's different? Um, yeah. So again, I just feel really, again, too blessed to be stressed. But I just, I'm so lucky that you know I'm sitting here and I can talk to you guys like this. And you know, you, you know, you think again as a kid when you're in hospital radio, which was like such, this magical thing. But you mm -hmm. now think, oh my goodness me, look at this. You know, here, here we're just chatting like this in front of computers and, mm. you know, we can talk all over the world and, you know, we don't need to. I, I, I was doing a thing, funnily enough, for a show at BBC Scotland from Aspen. And um, what happened was I normally do little inserts for them, but I had to go to Aspen to film. And then when I was there, I, I said, look, guys, actually what I could probably do is just do it by Skype on my phone. And it's this amazing thing where... You know, I'm in Aspen, up a mountain, mm. with my with my phone holding my phone up, <laughs> and I'm going live into a BBC show, yeah. and it looks, you know, amazing, the, yeah. amazing. And you think, yeah. you know, I, as a kid that was brought up when you'd have to have satellite trucks and cables <laughs> yeah. thrown everywhere, yeah. and yeah. you'd have to have, yeah. you know, this huge crew. And I, I mean, the, there's a lovely side to it. There's a downside to it, which is that unfortunately. It, you know, it, there's a lot of brilliant cameramen and people like that that are maybe not getting as much work, which I'm very aware of. And um, so I always encourage, you know, to do it properly. But it is amazing what you can do now. So, again, to, to be involved in this business at this point with all these things, it's amazing. And yeah. I think that's a that's a really interesting point as well, Ross, because looking at the way technology's gone and, mm. and the way that people are sort of, say lost their jobs or it's been a bit more difficult it, the landscape's got a lot more challenging as well even though it's opened up a lot of opportunities it's still a challenging place to be really mm. yeah yeah it, it, incredibly so and again with just everything moving so fast um that's why i think you do have to keep moving as well you know you just don't want to be one of those people who just goes <laughs> oh well you know it's all new now i don't want to get involved in anything you know that's that's it you've got to you've got to move with the times and some yeah. people don't and some people do yeah no yeah you do yeah. you've got to learn to adapt really haven't you yeah that's exactly it babe. i think i think it's definitely I definitely agree with you on that but i also think it's good to look back at what of what you've done and and just generally think oh i did that so that I suppose in my own mind, it makes you stronger going forward because you think, well, I achieved that, I achieved that. Did That didn't quite work out, but it was still a great yeah. experience. You mm -hmm. know? Exactly. Yeah, you learn yeah. from and it. Yeah. You learn from every. That's exactly it. It's, and it's so, so true. And it's what you you make of that experience and how you turn it around. Yeah. Um, yeah. You yeah. know, like, you know, like all, all entertainers, you know, we've all we've all gone out on a stage and and died on the stage for some reason or another. <laughs> um, but, you know, you learn from it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's it's a uh, us, you know, all the experiences that we have and we and we work to and we look back on it just I don't think there's any failures. When someone says, Oh, I failed at that, I would always say, Well not really, because you've learned from it. So you move yeah. on and, and you get a better experience from it, surely. Yeah, exactly. yeah you get stronger and yeah, improve. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So 
Bef- when you sort of left London, did you play the leading role in Dick Whittington, um, Sadler's Wells? Uh, no, I didn't. The, actually, it was a lovely guy, John Joe O'Neill, who was Dick Whittington. Ah. I was uh, I was in the... It was a musical for the Millennium in 2000. Um, we got nominated for an Olivia Award, which is amazing. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, John Joe O'Neill, lovely actor, and I see in loads of things. In fact, I saw him in um, The Queen's Gambit, I watched yep. him in that. Yeah, that's and, very um, good. Yeah. yeah, he was great. I was Toby McWhirey, who was a <laughs> sea captain who sounded suspiciously like Billy Connolly. Billy Connolly, yeah, just yeah. a wee bit, you know. So I kind of stole from Billy. <laughs> Hello, Toby McWhirey, also known as Billy. You know, that's great. So it was like that. So yes, it was great fun. Gillian Lynn. It yeah. was a wonderful lady who choreographed Cats. Yes. Yes. A whole host of brilliant musicals. So she uh, was the director. So that was just a great moment to to work with her. And yeah, that was the, my that was my last appearance in London's glittering West End uh, uh, before uh, I moved to uh, Los Angeles. Oh wow! So looking at that point, what would you say up until your career at that point, Ross, was your favourite area, radio or the theatre? What would you have said? Oh, everything. I absolutely, as I said, I loved every every bit. When I'm on stage, I love it. I'm doing radio, I love it. TV, films, everything. Yeah, there's not yeah. there's not one bit that I always think I prefer that. You know, and yeah. I, yeah. what happens sometimes is when you you sometimes when you do something, you realise why you love it so much. That that's the thing that you know. Sometimes you get back on a stage and then you get that immediate mm. audience response, and you're thinking, "Oh God, I forgot I that immediate audience response." And you you know, it's such a lovely thing and the energy of a of an audience. And um, I mean, it was it was interesting. I was on one of the cruise ships out in the, the Caribbean just before lockdown, and okay. you know, it was it was quite amazing when you think that was. I was on there in February, mm. uh, yeah, February a year ago. And that was wow. just when one of the other ships, you remember when they started that yeah. whole thing that they played yeah. yeah. coronavirus yeah. and all the rest of it. Yeah. And, yeah. Wow. You know, and it was great because we did a show which was a whole mixture of, of me singing and doing stories and audience reaction and, and participation as well. And it, that was lovely because it was quite funny. You know, I'd often say, you know, when I was chatting with the audience, it was like, it's okay, I'm not on the TV. You can, you can talk back to me. And, uh, um, yeah. and, it, was, and it was great. And, and we did this very kind of interactive show where, you know, we had a, a rough plan and we, you know, I had a, a, you know, a, you know, musical director and all the rest of it. So we, you know, we knew which songs we were going to do, but equally it was great that I would just tell a story. And then I said, you know, you can just shout out questions. You don't need to wait you know, we're not going to wait till the end of a question and answer session. Just as we go along, you know, it was it was really interesting that someone would just, you know, I'd mention something, then they go, "What about so and so?" Or you know, so it, was, <laughs> it was great. It was it was, quite, it was like being heckled in a good way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so your training did you um did you actually train in musical theatre originally? Was it? Uh, no, funnily enough, I was going to. Well, part of the plan was after failing at football and. Um, with my my local team Partick Thistle or to give them a full title Partick Thistle nil because <laughs> it's always yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Rangers three Partick Thistle nil <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. two Partick Thistle nil yeah. um, was <laughs> that um, I was going to hopefully apply and go to the the Royal Academy in Glasgow um, but then when I got into Radio Clyde uh, which was a big station in Scotland um, a couple of friends uh, one being Alan Cumming Whatever happened to Alan Cumming? Where, where did his career go? Um, yeah, 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 and Alan, yeah. Alan said to me, <laughs> the Tony Award winning, <laughs> um, and BAFTA Award winning, um, he's, you know, people were saying to me, look, Ross, you're going to get so many opportunities from being on the radio and having a little bit of a name that you should just go for that just now. And that's what I did. But then interestingly enough, well, not only interestingly enough for me, <laughs> when I came to America, uh, I went back to acting class here and I did uh, three years studying mm-hmm. here again. So I kind of went back to the studying side of it because I did feel that I kind of cheated a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's a bit like dogging off from double mass on a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I got away with it. Um, so, yes, I went back to here. So I, I, I did train here and, um, you know, I've also 
you know, d- d- from a singing point of view, I, I've been to a few different singing coaches. <laughs> hasn't mm. worked, but no, I've been to a few. <laughs> you know, Penny Harvey, Harvey Piper in in London, and then Zoe Tyler, who oh, some yeah. people will know from Loose Women. Uh, yeah. She lives in Florida, and she's a brilliant musical coach as well. So yeah, so I've been really lucky to have, have learned from some really good people. Brilliant. What sort of music are you into? What sort of vocals are you? Do you like singing? Oh, anything. I love. I love anything. I mean, when when we did the the show, um, I would do all kinds of music from swing, Bobby Darin, Sinatra, you know, Michael Bublé. Then we would do songs that I'd done in musicals. So we do everything from. Uh, I did Cliff Richard's musical Summer Holiday. So we do songs, you know. From, that yeah. uh, from Cliff, then we do the Rocky Horror Show because I played Frank and Furter in the Rocky Horror Show. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we do yeah, the yeah. Time Warp, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we do some rock and roll. Uh, yeah, we did just a, a whole mixture. So I, again, having such an eclectic taste in music definitely came from mum and dad because yeah. they had that. And in our house, there was no music that was bad. All music was good. So whatever, whatever you know, we wanted to listen to, we could. That's great. Yeah, that's really that is really yeah. cool. Because, and I, I think that comes back to saying earlier as well, Ross. That you know, looking back at your past and what you've done, it just helps you spur on and, and move forward. And I think every situation you go into, you think, oh, you know, I am going to do my best. And I agree with you. When mm. your mum says to you, "Do your best," mm. I think it took me to about twenty five, twenty six to think, well, what, what does my mum mean? And yeah, <laughs> you you wake up and and think. Oh, actually, that you know, that's what sort of why it happened and, and why she said it to me. So yeah, I agree, yeah. definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah, and just looking, I mean, how diverse your career has been over the years. I'm just looking at some of your film credits as well. You know, with <laughs> the day yeah. after tomorrow, yeah. half oh, past yeah. dead, <laughs> and you even with the voice role with Jenkins in Star Wars Jedi Fighter Two animation for Lucas Arts. Yeah. How did those sort of opportunities come about? What was it like? And you know, was there an audition process for those roles? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, it, it, I mean, voiceover has always been a great part of my life, um, and I've been so lucky that I got into it when I was a kid. And it's funny; I do remember being at home watching something in the TV when I was about twelve or thirteen, you know. And it would be like, in, you know, be one of those, um, um, you know, the Super Soroway sale this Sunday, and I would and I would sit and <laughs> yeah. go, the Super yeah. Soroway Sun, you know, whatever. And I'm thinking, oh. And I quite liked it. So then when I got into the the radio side of things, you know, obviously I was, as I said, I was so young. They didn't have a lot of young voices. So when they had this person that could do that and could talk to time as well, because again, it was very different then that everything was done actually on a tape. It was recorded onto a tape. Yeah. So you couldn't, you know, like now with computers, you could just take out a little breath or a little second. You, so if you went in and they said, this is a 30 second commercial and there's 27 seconds in the middle to talk for, you had to talk for 27 seconds, you know, and hit the yeah. beat at the end and all the rest of it. So it was it, 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 it was challenging, but it was mm. fun. I loved it. Um, so that was a great part of my life then. And then that continued into other stuff and if people in the UK call American Express, it's me that does all the voice prompts. So it's always funny <laughs> oh, with all yeah. my friends who, who call and then it's me going, hi, thank you for calling American Express. You know, <laughs> and, and then it's quite, what is quite funny is yeah. that if I have to call American Express when I'm in the UK, um, then it's, I hear myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then <laughs> eventually, <laughs> eventually I get someone goes, uh, hello, this is Dave at American Express. How can yeah, I help yeah, you? Yeah, and I'll go, yeah. if you'd like to speak to me in person, press one. <laughs> 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 and they go, what? I bet what? they get a bit confused. Like, yeah, oh. <laughs> if you'd like to order drugs, press hash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's, um, so it's fun. But then, yeah, that continued and then came out here, did some animation. And again, one of the 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 Star Wars, uh, the video games as well. And they wanted, what, what was quite funny, it was really um it was really kind of like c3po is was what they were going for uh, you know from um you know from star wars um and so it was very much like ew ew i've been hit you know it was all like ew, yeah, ew, yeah my yeah. goodness me yeah um and so <laughs> the, the the weirdest part was that anthony daniels who 
is the real C-3PO yeah. in all mm-hmm. the, the yeah, Star yeah. Wars movies. I interviewed him at KTLA oh, and I was oh, telling him, cool. I said, yeah. you know, I said I had to do this video game and I said, it was kind of, kind of me trying to be you. And he said, well, go on then, do it. And I was like, okay, fine. Oh, I've been hit. And he went, it sounds nothing like me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's cut the interview now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so again, just so lucky to get to do so many different and uh, and various things. And yeah, with the movies as well. Yeah, go through the whole audition process and yeah. and you end up playing an FBI agent in a Steven Seagal movie, Half Past Dead. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's very strange. And you get to see things like, yeah, we got something. Cellular transmission. <laughs> Cell 7A. <laughs> and you'd be this ridiculous accent. <laughs> Although it's funny, I do remember when I was a kid, um, the uh, you, you know you had those those uh, incredible voices when it'd be like you know at a cinema near you from Thursday. Yeah, yeah. and I remember yeah. one day um, being in the <laughs> studio and somebody hadn't turned up, and they were like, and I, of course at that time I was still very young, and it was all way hey, hey up, up there, everything's like in your super sorry son, and um, and then they said <laughs> oh, we need one of those voices. It was a guy called Bill Mitchell was the legend that used to do most of those, and um, and I had to go into a studio, and they just said, look, we're really desperate, we need this now, and I remember, and I would probably be. 19 or something like that in a studio with my voice like that and then suddenly going <laughs> at a cinema near you from thursday you know, yeah. like, now love it. Yeah. <laughs> i think um you probably will remember this as well ross i think my first experience of cinema was in 78 when i attended the very first star wars movie and that was just wow. for not that was in edinburgh mm. that was with my auntie mm. oh. it was my, my first time in scotland back with, with my mum and to see all the family and she said look your treat for this weekend is we're going to take you to see star wars at the edinburgh playhouse and i've never forgotten it it was mm. magical absolutely wow. magical do you know this is really weird that on, on my computer here or like it was on my phone it must be because it picks up in things, and it's come up here on Wikipedia, and it says C-3PO, and I've just looked down, and it's portrayed by Anthony Daniels, yeah. episodes mm. two to whatever it is, is it yeah. nine, somewhere? And yeah, then yeah. underneath it, it says, voiced by Anthony Daniels, most media, other, and then it's got Fred Young, pinball game, and it's got Ross King, Star Wars, Jedi Starfighter. Wow. <laughs> Oh. And then it's got Simon Pegg, Phineas and Ferb. Oh, I'm in good company. Wow. Well, there you go. Yeah. There wow. you go. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Not mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. Big Brother is listening in. Exactly. In the Big Brother house. <laughs> if you want to evict him, press five. Yeah. <laughs> Day three and Becky and Pete are bored out the box. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. So with you being from Scotland, Ross, following yes. the likes of Sean Connery, do you think there's any yes. sort of, uh, maybe you play in James Bond anytime soon then? Oh, that would be <laughs> absolutely splendid. I'd love to have done that. But sadly, <laughs> sadly, it has to be said, I'm far too old now. Um, so, yeah, I think, I, you imagine it. Yeah, every single kid always wanted to be James yeah. Bond. Although, oh, funnily yeah. enough, I just interviewed, I don't know if you've seen Minari, which is the movie it's up for an Oscar. It's a beautiful movie uh, with a, a Korean family and there's a young boy in it, um, Alan Kim, who got the Critics' Choice uh, Award for Best Young Actor. He's nominated for a BAFTA. And I interviewed him the other day on Zoom and he's eight. He was seven when he made the movie. Oh, he's wow. eight now. And there was this, there's a great photograph of him on uh, his Instagram page of him in a tuxedo. And I said to him, you know, something like, you know, it'd be great, you know, and, and maybe, you know, when you get older, you become James Bond. You'll be the first Korean James Bond. And he mm. said, I don't know who James Bond is. <laughs> no. Oh, no. Oh. And, I was, and it's so funny. And it, it, I, I, I played the Laugh Factory here uh, on Sunset Boulevard in, in Vegas uh, a couple of years ago. And I was doing, hopefully, some gags. And also, I was doing some impressions. And I was doing Michael Caine. And I was doing Sean Connery. And it was really interesting that before I went on, one of the guys said to me, he said, you know, you're doing impressions. I said, yeah, I'll just put in a couple. I'll put in David Beckham and I'll do Sean Connery and Michael Caine. He said, oh, if you do Sean Connery, 
just remind the audience that he was the first James Bond. And if you're doing Michael Caine, you should maybe say, you know, he was Batman's butler. And it's so so weird. And you realise as you're getting older that some people have no idea. And, you know, there is this, you know, an eight-year-old kid obviously doesn't know who James Bond is. No idea. Yeah, it's, It's interesting. Just that thing of you've just always got to be aware that, People are not as aware of things because they're young. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I think we, like you assume and you think somebody knows, oh, actually, because of this. And they say, well, I've never yeah. actually heard of that person. You think, wow. Mm. Well, wow. That's, um... mm. and I think, um, obviously, you've been in Los Angeles a long time, Ross, and coming from Scotland. Mm. The good thing is you haven't lost your accent, have you? You've still no. got a really nice, broad Scottish accent. And mm. how... Did you feel you adapted to LA lifestyle quite quickly or did it take you a while to actually sort of adapt to it? No, I I think I adapted really quickly. I I loved it. I've always loved it here. I first came out in 93 to cover the Oscars uh, for the BBC in Pebble Mill. And I just loved it. And I got here and I thought, I'm going to live here. And I had a chance to come out round about then. Um, I had a couple of offers and I said no because I was younger and I was doing you know, a lot of TV in Britain and I was very happy. Um, But I always knew that I would come out here and I I thought I would come out here and live. Um, And yeah, I adapted really quickly. I mean, in terms of my accent, I've always sort of prided myself in the fact that even when I was working full time in American TV at KTLA, you know, no one ever said, sorry, what did he say? I can't understand. (laughs) So I've always been lucky like that. And again, to have an, a Scottish accent that is not too, not too thick in terms that, you know, that people can understand it. You know, mm-hmm. you know how sometimes they have things, say like train spotting when they put up subtitles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a bit crazy. Um, yeah. So yeah, I've been really, really fortunate like that. But yeah, no, I love, I love the LA way of life. I love, you know, the 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 fitness aspect of it as well. I think that's been great. I think that's kept me, you know, I, I still play football you know, fairly regularly, you get out, you know, you're out, you know, I, I do laugh, they always say hiking here, which is just a walk for us, but that, that's one thing that always made me <laughs> laugh. People say, hey, Ross, you want to go for a hike at the weekend? And I was like, I, I don't have, you know, I was thinking, I don't have a, have a rucksack and I don't have my <laughs> yeah, hiking yeah, like mountaineering. Go, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's just a walk. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can do yeah, that. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I mean, the, the good thing as well, Ross, you're still continuing to play sport and it's mm. one of the things I wanted to sort of say to you as well is that I played professional football for a while, but I had oh. an injury. Oh, um, just one of those things, yeah. and, and it, it just just happened. And but one of my last trials I finally had, I came back from playing in Europe, and um, I, I was invited to have a trial at Hart Midlothian. Oh and wow! It didn't, didn't quite work out. Yeah. I didn't. It didn't. Just didn't work out, and I had an mm-hmm. ankle injury. But my mum always wanted me to play. And funny enough, it's a little bit of trivia for you on my side. When I was twelve, I. I sort of signed semi-professional terms and I sort of went on to, to you know, play for some really good clubs and I was really fortunate. But my mum, she said, when it comes to you playing for your country, you're playing for Scotland. So <laughs> I already I already registered. To, my oh. mum and dad already registered for me to play for Scotland. So if I was, oh. if I ever got that far, yeah. I would have definitely played for yeah. Scotland. So, oh. um, yeah, yeah. So just, just a little bit of trivia there for Because my mum, I said, oh, no, mum, that wasn't a choice. I'm, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have played for anyone else. It would have been Scotland, and, and that would have oh, been it. So, but no, no. but you still play five a side. So you play weekly. I or? play eleven a sides as well. Yeah. No, oh I, wow. Yeah. Oh no, wow. I love it. You got Bath to LA. We had a, got a, a good team out here. I also think you know again that was the most wonderful thing of 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 going into the business that I did from a football point of view that I got to play with the most amazing footballers. And actually, I, I got to play for Scotland against England at Wembley Stadium uh, before yes. the, the boys club final. And, mm-hmm. yes. you know, it was it was incredible. You know, Danny McGrain from yep. Celtic was the captain. We had yep. Archie Gamble, Eddie yep. Gray. You know, they had Mick Mills, Phil Neal, uh, David. Stevie Coppel. Was Stevie, Stevie Coppel. Coppel oh, it was incredible. Yep. And, you know, and again, and I just saw this week that uh, Frank Worthington had passed away. And yes. I, you know, yes. back in the the '90s, I would play with uh, Emlyn Hughes' um, team, and Frank would play, and he would take all the penalties, and he would backheel them, and <laughs> yeah. score every time. Yeah, yeah. 
And, yeah. you know, yeah. to get to play with guys like that, that obviously I would never in a gajillion years have ever been on the same field with. Well, the funny thing mm. is, Ross, is um, mm. when I've played and or, or friends of mine have, have said it, when, when they watch football on telly, it's like anything, and they say, oh, it doesn't really look, you know, it doesn't really look that great. So I, you take them to a premiership game or a European game and say, look, now you're going to see how quickly the ball oh. actually moves. They, they, they come away saying, I didn't really understand how quickly these players mm. are. I said, no, they're phenomenal. Oh. I said, they, you don't see it on the telly. And, no. and a good semi-professional player makes a makes an amateur look you know pretty poor to be honest oh with you. it's incredible it's it's incredible it is incredible and it, i think people don't really appreciate it. they just see the, the i suppose the the money that players get paid but mm. i always say yeah but that's only for one percent that's not for the other mm. thousands of players that are actually struggling to you know to uh, mm. earn a living as well yeah and when you exactly as you say i mean i always say to people you know if you think back to when you were at school who was the best player in the school and where where is he now? And the chances are, even he didn't make it. Yeah, <laughs> and that's yeah. it. And you know, and you. I mean, I remember one time we were playing out here. Clang dropped that name up at Robbie Williams' house, and <laughs> ba- Barry Barry Venison um, yes. was playing. Yes. You know, ex Sunderland, Good Newcastle, yeah. Liverpool. Yeah. And one time, I just knocked the ball back to him, and he decided to shoot from a little bit of a way out, but he hit the ball. And as he put his foot through the ball, it was a bit like playing tennis with somebody who really plays tennis, you know, like a professional or a golfer. There's a different sound. I, I, I stopped <laughs> and I just yeah. said, can I just hear that sound again? Because I've never heard that sound when the ball has come off my foot. And it's that thing. It's And again, it's like with my luck of having played tennis with Sue Barker and loads of ex-pros, when they hit the ball, the sound is just different. And it was the same. Mm. And it's funny that people, again, don't don't realise that. And again, as you're saying there, Pete, if you go and watch, you know, a game when it's professionals, even just the sound of the ball is different. It's because they just know how to put their foot through it. And it's... It's it's so weird that again everyone thinks they can do it and everybody wanted to be a footballer and everyone thought they were going to be a footballer, but as we know, very few do. It is really competitive, and I think even in me looking back when I was thirteen and fourteen, Ross, and you know, seventeen, eighteen. You now you're going into a changing room and you're one 0 down at half time. The manager just destroys the changing room or, or just tells you he just has a complete go at you and for for whatever reason and you've got to turn up in the next half and actually play and if you don't play you're sacked or you, mm. you're, you're down the road and I think it sort of stands you in good stead really because you think well am I good am I going to be any good am I going to come up against obviously better players and I think mm. I don't know I think it's a good grounding really to be honest with you yeah, yeah. But I, don't, I don't I actually think now and I've spoken to a couple of managers that I don't think you can get the the berating that <laughs> that you did you know i mean i i you know i obviously was never became a professional footballer but you know i had a few <laughs> few managers over my little career you know where they really gave you a hard time but i hear now that it's very hard even you know to to do that because of the change in the world yeah. and all the rest of it so it'd be interesting now that you know i think the days of like Sir Alex Ferguson giving people the hairdryer, I think yeah. they may have yeah. gone. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I, th- I mean, I, I had a couple of managers that semi-professional. You know, you turned up late for training. Um, you know, you would get, you know, docked your, your wages for that week. Or if you didn't have a good performance, then, mm-hmm. you know, he would, you'd have to clean the whole changing rooms. Oh, and, wow. Oh, I, I had, I, I had a funny story. I had, um, I won't mention the club, but if you had a poor performance or your training wasn't particularly good, then you had to clean all of the changing rooms, home and away. Mm. Uh, they would make you clean, you know, the toilets and everything, and you'd have to do all the kit, and it'd have to be all pressed, do all the boots. And if you didn't do that right, you do it again the following week. So there was lots oh, of wow. things that you had yeah. you had to do. Um, and I suppose I look at it now when you know youngsters say to me, Ross, oh, I'm going to play for Juventus or I'm going to play for Inter Milan or or you know heart melodian for example yeah i'm thinking yeah good luck with that one but i i I think 
you're going to struggle and you just think you're going to turn up and, you know, get a million pounds a game. Yeah. <laughs> it, doesn't yeah. work, it doesn't work like that. No, sadly. Sadly not. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. But no, no. I, I suppose the only other point I wanted to ask you on, on that side is how have you found the difference between, I suppose, soccer in the States compared to the UK? Is it any different? Is it better? I mean, it's nowhere near, you know. I mean, it's fun. But, you know, I think when I remember going to see David Beckham um, when he moved out here and, you know, I could almost see in his face the exasperation of, you know, oh, my goodness me, this is not nowhere near a level that I thought. Um, You know, I I think people maybe thought it was it was better than it was. So it's not it's not great. You know, and then that's, you know, you have like when Ibrahimovic Came over and played for the galaxy you know it was yeah. it was brilliant it was like men against <clears throat> boys it was just it was just <clears throat> funny watching him um <laughs> <laughs> it was like wow you can almost see him going this is easy this yeah. is not easy <laughs> and just sort of seeing everything that david's doing obviously with his team in in is it miami that he's miami he's yeah to yeah do you think that will actually he will i, I know this the talk of all sorts of players going. Do you think mm. that that will happen? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. No, it looks like it's all coming along no. well. He's got um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Phil Neville out there as his team coach now, and so, oh, cool. so yeah. I think David's very happy. You know, I think it's going very well. <laughs> uh, Victoria will be coming out soon, and I think it's going to be great. Yeah, I well, think it's, it's going to be great. Yeah. Be a good team. Yes, yeah, great team. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that's all for part one. Join us again next week with part two when we continue the conversation with Ross King. And now it's time to introduce the entertainment engine artist in the spotlight. And this month we are featuring Ayana Witter Johnson. Ayana is an English composer, singer, songwriter, and cellist. Her notable performances include opening the MOBO Awards pre show in 2016 and playing the Royal Albert Hall, London, in 2018. Ayana has recently appeared on Channel 4, Sing It Loud, and later with Jules Holland, BBC One. And now it's over to Ayana to introduce her latest single. Hi, I'm Ayana Witter Johnson, singer, songwriter, and cellist from London. It's amazing to be featured on the Entertainment Engine podcast. Here's my single, Rise Up, featuring Akala. Hope you enjoy it. Hear the sound. I am the speaker. Come gather round. My ears are burning. Tell me the news. Cause there's a rumor that something's about to break loose. Did you hear that? Did you feel that? Getting louder. Can you hear that? Can you feel that? Getting louder. Fires are burning deep in the night. While you are sleeping, they feed the vibes. Under the stars, they're starting to sing. And there's a Stop this thing Did you hear that? Did you feel that? Getting louder
resist the pressure and the power hungry you're falling we lose our focus it feels like we are just crawling once we know ourselves our behavior changes according the power is within our skin and not the king the crown is our natural redeem never give in more dangerous the chains on our brain than on our limbs so we'll never change the way we behave unless we think in a manner different than common power design is property over people need a paradigm shift creating our future right now with how we live know that do respond to intentions so and let us live All this in the bones to dethrone their old myths Aim all that we have by showing our own gifts People, the time is now, so rise up Once we wise up, you know that the time's up Rise up Wow, that's such a great track. Me and Pete really enjoyed that. And if you want to learn more about Ayana, you can check out her website at ayanamusic.com. So please keep those artist submissions coming so we can feature more great independent music from around the world. And remember, when you submit music to us, please do it in link format, no attachments, please. So drop us your links and bio to our email, podcast at seamlessentertainment.co.uk. Well, that's all for today's episode of The Entertainment Engine. And thanks for listening. Join us again next week for part two of The Conversation with Ross King. Plus, we will have our question of the day and music and movie facts for our listeners. It would be great to have your feedback on the show. So please drop us a message at any time. We would love to hear from you. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favourite podcast platforms so you never miss an episode. Thanks for listening to the show. And remember to all stay safe. The Entertainment Engine.